Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. Here is Dr. Matt Balhoff, the director. Thank you, Joanna, and welcome everyone to the monthly webinar series in the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. I'm the director of the center and a professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. To learn more about us, please visit our website and feel free to contact us about how to collaborate. A little bit about more about who we are. Uh, we are a center in the Cockrell School at the University of Texas at Austin. We have 24 faculty and PIs in addition to many research associates and graduate students who do research in the area of subsurface energy. Our research um, is a combination of subsurface applications, technical disciplines, and engineering tools. As you see here, we work on oil and gas as well as other subsurface applications. Our technical disciplines cover traditional petroleum engineering disciplines like reservoir production, drilling engineering, and formation evaluation, but also include things like data analytics, rock mechanics, and computational sciences, and then we use a number of engineering tools. We collaborate with industry in a number of different ways. One of them is through our industrial affiliates projects. Um, our IAPs are listed here. I've highlighted hydraulic fracturing and sand control because our speaker today, Mukul Sharma, is a leader of that IAP, and he may tell us a little bit more about it. Uh, finally, just to let you know a little bit more about what our monthly webinars are. So they are informative industry driven webinars by researchers and collaborators within the center. Uh, they are typically the first Friday of the month at noon, um, as is today, and uh, we are using the platform teams. All webinars will be uploaded on our YouTube page afterwards, but we do encourage you to participate live so that you can ask questions if necessary. A few upcoming webinars. Uh, Zoya Haidari, Dr. Dr. Haidari will give a talk on January 8th which actually isn't the first Friday of the month because that's New Year's Day. But January 8th, she will give a talk on advanced formation evaluation of organic rich mud rocks, honoring a rock fabric and geochemistry. And in February, John Foster will be giving a talk. So here's a little uh, flyer of Dr. Hadari's talk in January. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Makul Sharma, who is a professor in Tex Moncrief Junior Centennial Endowed Chair in Petroleum Engineering in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering and the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment at the University of Texas at Austin. McCool has been at the university for 35 years. He holds a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology and MS and PhD degrees in chemical and petroleum engineering from the University of Southern California. McCool's won many, many awards. Most notably, he's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering and has won very many SBE awards. Recently, he was named an honorary member of the society, which is given to less than 0.1% of its members. So with that, I will um, turn it over to McCool. All right. So, um, my, my topic today is going to be uh, integrated fracture geomechanics and reservoir simulation using the fit for purpose tool. Um, uh, the guys that actually did this work over the last uh, 10 years or so are listed here. I particularly want to acknowledge the current members of the team, uh, Shuang and uh, Ashish and Meng and, and uh, Min, who have been actually involved in uh, some of the results that I'll be showing you today but there's been an ongoing effort for about 10 years on in this area and many of the past members are uh, with various companies now. Uh, this this uh, uh, tool was developed uh, as a part of the hydraulic fracturing and sand control JIP, which many of the companies fund. Um, at the last meeting we had in, in uh, September, uh, we actually had uh, four different sessions um, uh, two, over two days. Uh, the fracture modeling session is what I'll be focusing on today, which talked about um, uh, integrating uh, fracture modeling with uh, in, a, in a tool called Multifract 3D, and so that's what I'll be talking about. Um, but I we, we also have projects related to refracturing, which I may not have a chance to talk about today, and then fracture growth in naturally fractured rocks, uh, which again I will not have a chance to talk about today. Um, 
Now, integrating this model with uh, reservoir simulation, uh, we have actually done quite a bit of work on looking at all of this integration, which you'll hear about today. And we've done some work on sand failure and sand production, as well as a modeling of geothermal uh, wells that we're just starting. Uh, on the second day, we talked about fracture diagnostics, uh, defit analysis, water hammer, pressure interference testing, strain measurements, and some EM uh, measurements for fracture diagnostics. So I will not have a chance to talk about any of that, but if you're interested in this, uh, please email or, or call. And uh, the hydraulic fracturing and sand control JIP does has been working in this in these diagnostic areas for a long time. Uh, rock fluid interactions is an experimental part of the program. Um, we spend an afternoon on talking about fracture conductivity and prop and embedment issues, as well as multi-phase flow properties, measurements in shales, um, and, and then oil recovery in shales. We've done quite a few experiments, um, about 40 different core floods on huff and puff gas injection with CO2 and rich gas as well. Um, so this, these are all uh, projects that are part of the hydraulic fracturing and sand control JIP. And if you are interested in this, please feel free to, uh, uh, to call or email, and we'd love to see you uh, participate in the program as well. So before I get into um, the, the, the specifics of our model, uh, I do want to point out that there's many different approaches and many types of models available for doing hydraulic fracturing and reservoir simulation, as you know. Um, finite volume, finite element, extended finite element, et cetera, displacement discontinuity methods, uh, discrete element models, and so on. Uh, and there's many groups at the university. There's at least uh, three other groups at the university that do um, models related to uh, some of these different things that do excellent work in this area. So I'm going to summarize the work that we have uh, been working, that we have done in this modeling area and show you how uh, some of the, uh, the problems that we faced um, when we started about 15 years ago um, have been addressed uh, with, our, with our approach. So integrating fracture propagation, geomechanics, and reservoir simulation in one uh, model has tremendous advantages uh, because you can uh, really integrate a lot of different things that you do in the field into under one umbrella. But it is much more complicated than reservoir simulation alone. Um, it is essentially reservoir simulation on steroids because you're trying to address not only the flow problem, the compositional flow problem, but also the geomechanics and the propagation of uh, multiple fractures. So I'll talk about the complexities of the problem and uh, how what we've done to address these complexities. Um, but I do want to say that no single model can hope to address all of these aspects of the problem in detail. There's no way you can have one model that does everything and covers all physical aspects of the problem. So to make it a practically useful tool, it is important to provide user flexibility to choose the physics of the problem that's essential to their application and the numerical complexity that is required depending on the problem being solved. So as developers of models, it is it falls on our shoulders to actually do this. As, and as a user, the user needs to um, realize that uh, choosing the right physics and the numerical complexity is essential to being to getting answers in a reasonable period of time. What is the essential physics that we need to incorporate? So this is a list that I had uh, developed about 10 years ago and um, in terms of what I felt was essential physics that was not currently incorporated in hydraulic fracturing models or in um, uh, reservoir simulators. They, I've grouped them into four categories. Fracture complexity, interaction between fractures, the stress, the stress shadow that occurs when you have multiple fractures propagating and interacting with each other photoelastic and thermoelastic effects, which need to be modeled correctly, non-planar fractures, multi-stranded fractures, which, you ha which we see lots of evidence of in the field. Um, there's, of course, rock complexity that we always deal with. Um, the creation of these induced unpropped fractures, uh, heterogeneity in the rocks, including natural fracture networks, as well as inelastic rock behavior. So things like unconsolidated sands or shales that might have a plastic component to them. Um, then they have, you have fluid complexity, um, improper prop and transport models in the fracture, uh, compressible fluids, non-isothermal flow, uh, etc., uh, turbulent flow and phase changes that occur in the wellbore and in the fracture, uh, 
And then finally, wellbore effects, uh, propane transport in the wellbore and propane distribution between perforations or clusters of perforations in the wellbore. Uh, over the last uh, decade, we've uh, tackled every single one of these bullets. And um, what I'll show you is some, some aspects of this. I don't have the time to go through every one of them, but uh, we have looked at every single one of these and try to incorporate as much as we can into our models. Now, our approach has been to build uh, shared libraries in C++ uh, that we call FROG. So this is, we, we call this FROG uh, as, as a short form for framework for operations in general geomechanics. So these FROG libraries are modular, um, but they do fit together very well. So they're designed in a way that uh, a library developed by, by one student can then be incorporated into the model in a fairly seamless fashion. So for example, if somebody were to develop uh, a new dynamic mesh refinement method within, this, within these libraries, then that could be incorporated very readily into the code. Or if somebody built uh, a compositional model for reservoir simulation, that could be incorporated readily into the code as long as the structure of the code is follows uh, this, this library uh, specifications. That allows multiple uh, students um, to actually work simultaneously to develop these, these capabilities and be able to integrate all of those developments into, into a single uh, model. And so that's been an extremely useful approach to follow because it doesn't, uh, you don't have developments happening in series, but rather in parallel. And it really makes a big difference in terms of being able to achieve um, um, this, this sort of, these sort of capabilities, which are very hard to, um, uh, accomplish if you're doing them one after the other. Something we've done in the last five years is to use surrogate models, uh, which I'll show you one example of, um, and uh, you'll see how, how that works as well. So the way the model is structured, uh, and I'll talk only about Multifract 3D and not, not about the other projects or models that we're working on. Um, in Multifract 3D, uh, the, the model is structured in, into three, is broken into three domains. There's a reservoir domain, there's a fracture domain, and there's a wellbore domain. In the reservoir domain, you solve the classical equations that you solve in reservoir simulation, the pressure equation, the component balance equations for a, for a uh, compositional simulator. You do an equation of state calculation to get the phases and so forth. You also incorporate the solid deformation equation, uh, the geomechanics part. Right, and an energy balance to get the temperature. And so thermoelasticity, poroelasticity, phase behavior, thermal conduction and convection are all taken into account in the reservoir. Right? So this is what the reservoir domain solution is. You then have the fracture domain, which has essentially uh, similar equations, except now you also have the propane transport. Uh, so the propane is also being transported down the fracture, and that's very important in terms of the conductivity of the fracture. So fracture width and conductivity is coupled with the solid deformation equation. The leak off and the production is coupled between the fracture and the reservoir, of course. And of course, the, the energy balance, the thermal flux is coupled. So these are fully coupled together. And then the fracture itself is coupled with the wellbore domain, where the wellbore pressure uh, and, the, and the component balance equations are solved, uh, and the temperature equation as well. And so you can actually couple everything together through appropriate boundary conditions uh, and incorporate them all into a single model. So that's the overall structure of uh, this. One question I often get asked is, why do we have to model the fracture domain or the wellbore domain explicitly? Um, if you if you uh, think about uh, how a resonator would incorporate geomechanics, the single easiest way of doing it is to say, I can put high permeability reservoir grid blocks uh, in the reservoir simulator and represent my fracture in that manner. So I can, I can represent the fracture as high permeability grid blocks. However, the, when we try to do that, we realize that it is actually quite essential to put explicit cracks in the reservoir continuum. And when I mean, when I mean explicit cracks, what I mean is you actually have uh, the mesh being split and you actually have a finite width, which is quite small, right? And then uh, you can actually solve fluid and transport uh, of the propane in the fracture. You can relate the fracture width to the fracturing pressure. You can account for stress interference between multiple fractures. So you have multiple cracks propagating in this 
reservoir continuum. And you can implement things like the proper fracture propagation criteria at the tip, um, allow for fracture turning, model fracture networks, et cetera. So there's many advantages to doing this. Of course, there is a computational price that you have to pay to actually account for these explicitly. But in, in, in a sense, this is what makes um, our model fairly unique in the way it, and the capabilities that it has. Right? The next few slides I'm going to go through fairly quickly because I don't have the time to really devote to them. Um, but I'm going to show you how um, the solid deformation uh, is solved for in the reservoir. So this is the equation that, that basically solves for the displacement U, uh, which allows us to then calculate uh, the, the stresses and the strains at any point in the reservoir. The flow equations you're familiar with, for those of you that work in reservoir simulation, this is a black oil reservoir simulator. Uh, the compositional flow is, uh, is, is also quite familiar to you. The component balances and so forth are solved uh, just like in a reservoir, a compositional reservoir simulator. The thermal and the, and the thermoelastic terms uh, are an energy balance as well as a portoelastic term as, and, and a, a thermoelastic term. And these thermoelastic terms are actually quite um, uh, quite important in many, many applications. So both of these terms have to be properly accounted for. Um, for a black oil, of course, uh, in the fracture, we solve uh, either compositional or black oil inside the fracture. And so the similar equations inside the fracture. Um, you can also have a multi-phase, multi-transport, a multi-propent transport inside the fracture. And this would account for the propent retardation, the proper settling, and uh, um, there were a couple of PhD students that spent uh, know, five or six years on looking at proper transport in great detail, experimentally as well as on the modeling side. Um, then, of course, uh, you have to uh, these proper transport uh, characteristics affect the rheology of the fluid as well. Um, a very important aspect of the problem when you consider explicit fractures is fracture closure. So you can actually model fracture closure based on the depletion of the reservoir and the effect of stress acting on the fracture uh, faces. So this is something that is important to, um, to model properly. On top of the geomechanics, you have to be able to uh, allow the fracture to propagate uh, and the fracture propagation method we use uh, is a stress intensity factor based method, which allows us to compute not only how much the fracture will grow, but in what direction the fracture will grow. So you can turn the fracture uh, at an angle that is controlled by uh, the stress intensity factor calculations um, at the fracture tip. So this is something that is that has been implemented. We have mode one and mode two opening in this in the model. And then finally, we have uh, conservation equations in the wellboard itself that are fully coupled to the uh, 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 the fractures. Uh, and the fluid distribution in these is controlled by um, uh, the flow resistance is offered by the fractures and the perforations across multiple clusters and multiple perforations. Um, I want to show you how we uh, just an, one example of how we incorporate surrogate models uh, for these for these things. So if you consider a, a case where you have, let's say, four clusters and you have multiple perforations in each cluster, and this is a plug and you're pumping down the wellbore. Fluid and propent is leaking off and entering these fractures. The question is how much fluid and how much propent enters each cluster? And are those proportions the same as what you're pumping? So we, um, uh, Wei Wei, uh, uh, Sean Wu and, and uh, uh, Shi Teng Yi, uh, and, and Min Zhang have been working on simulating this. Um, uh, so we actually do CFT DEM simulations in the wellbore with 100 to 200,000 particles. And we have a perforation here where the fluid is leaking off. And what we find is that because of the, um, the inertia of the particles, the, the, the proportion of solids entering the perforations is quite a bit smaller than the proportion of solids in the wellbore. So in other words, if 10% of the fluid leaks off here in this perforation, perhaps only 5% of the solids are going to go with it. As a consequence of that, the concentration of solids increases as you go down the wellbore, 
And that has extremely important implications in terms of which fractures actually grow and which fractures uh, don't. So these CFD DM simulations take about two or three days on the supercomputer at UT. So it's impractical to incorporate this into a full a numerical simulator like Multifract 3D. So what we have done is to build surrogate models, which are proper and transport efficiency correlations. And these surrogate models look like this. So this proper and transport efficiency versus the perforation flow ratio, each of these data points is from those CFD DEM simulations for different wellbore diameters, different proper and densities, different fluid uh, flow rates, etc. And then these surrogate models are used, uh, are simple correlations based on these very complex simulations that we can then put into uh, our multifrac simulations. And this has extremely important consequences for uh, how the fractures grow uh, from the wellbore. And in fact, a large part of the increase in production that we've seen in many unconventional reservoirs comes from applying uh, this basic idea of uh, non-uniform distribution of slurry into these into these perforation clusters. Um, so multifract 3D, uh, of course, um, the matrix structure, you have the, the, the displacement equations, uh, which is a vector. Is displacement is UX, UI, UZ. The pressure equations, the pressure inside the fracture, you can have different kinds of propent being pumped, and of course the distribution coefficients for the propent within the wellbore. So all of this can be incorporated into a matrix structure either solved uh, semi-implicitly or fully implicitly, and we have both options. Um, and of course, uh, uh, to really get this uh, to the point where it can be run more efficiently, you can parallelize this. And so we've implemented uh, a, a parallelized version of this by this domain decomposition, uh, by assigning uh, these domains um, into each of the CPUs. And you get, you get pretty good speed up, you get good scaling. Uh, as you increase the number of CPUs, you get about a factor of anywhere from seven to more speed up depending on the size of the problem and the number of CPUs being used. Mesh refinement could also is also implemented. Uh, automatic refinement and unrefinement has been implemented. So you can see um, multiple fractures propagating, turning away from each other um, and so forth. And the, the mesh is refined uh, twice in this example, uh, uh, just around the fractures as they propagate. So this is dynamic mesh refinement that really speeds up uh, things. So I've described the model to you um, and um, shown you how all of this, uh, all of these different types of physics uh, can be incorporated into this. Um, however, uh, to make this usable uh, by a field engineer or an engineer that wants to design a fracture or design a, uh, a, a well pad from a reservoir simulation point of view and a fracturing simulation point of view, you have to communicate with, um, with the field engineer in a way that addresses the, his needs, his or her needs, right? So you may not, so the field engineer may not really understand the physics of the model as well as, as the, the modeler might, but uh, uh, I think he needs a quick answer. And um, it's important to, for us to do some fit for purpose simulations that address the specific needs of the field engineer. So what I'm gonna show you is some examples, just maybe three examples of, of fit for purpose simulations that can be run depending on the problem that's being solved. So the user choices that you might have, for example, is does the user want to run a reservoir simulation or a fracture simulation? This could be a pre-specified fracture geometry, or do you want to run an integrated fracturing and reservoir simulation where you create the fractures first and then you run the reservoir simulation afterwards? How complicated do you want to make the problem? Do you want to make it only flow? Uh, you want to couple geomechanics? Do you want to have one-way coupling, two-way coupling between the geomechanics and the fluid flow? Do you want portal elastoplasticity? Do you want to include plasticity in it, et cetera, et cetera? So there's many choices here. Do you want to make the simulation compositional, single phase, black oil? These choices uh, in basically tell you whether the simulation is going to last for three seconds or three days, right? Whether it's 2D, whether it's 3D, whether you want to, uh, run this in a fully implicit manner or a semi-implicit manner and so forth. So the time required for these simulations very much depends on the choices the user makes in this. And the choice that the user makes must be a fit for purpose choice that ultimately solves the problem that they're trying to solve. So let me give you an example. 
So um, let's start with a single well fracture design problem. So if you want to integrate the design of the completion, which is perforation clusters and the pumping schedule. So you're designing a pumping schedule and a completion for a well for hydraulic fracturing in a, in a horizontal well. And there are many other examples I could give you, but I'm going to show you this one here. Um, uh, by the way, we've done all of these so energized fluids, um, multi fracture propagation, use of stranded gas as a fracturing fluid, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So going back to this issue of how much sand enters each perforation and how do we utilize that? When people run fiber optic sensors in these wells, what they find is that most of the propent ends up closer to the heel than the toe. So you get heel dominated fractures. So this is the sand placement. 35% is going here. About 59% is going here. Only about five or 6% is ending up in the last two perforation clusters. So the heel is taking all the sand, whereas these ones are not. And the reason that occurs is that you have this concentration of sand increasing as you go downstream towards the toe and that causes a screen out of the last couple of perforation clusters. So when you put in our uh, prop and transport efficiency curves, you end up with screen outs in the last two. So these are the simulation results and you end up with dominant clusters that actually give you something that looks very similar to what you see in these uh, measurements, these fiber optic measurements in the field. And there's been several papers written on this and uh, on DAS and distributed acoustic sensing uh, as well as DTS, uh, which is distributed temperature sensing, and they're consistent in, in, in what they show. So if you want to run this and optimize this completion rather than running, let's say, four perforations in each cluster, which is what this design is. Um, so there's eight clusters uh, with a 15 meter cluster spacing. Uh, four perforations per cluster, which is what this design is. For a given pumping schedule, you can run an optimizer, a genetic algorithms optimizer that runs multifrac 3D hundreds of times and optimizes the completion design. And when you do optimize the completion design, what you find is that you get a much more uniform um, distribution of sand and fluids into the perforation clusters. So the optimum, for example, the standard deviation is here for the sand and for the fluid, for the water, whereas the standard deviation is much higher for uh, four perforations per cluster. So for this design, you get a higher standard deviation. For this design, you get a much lower standard deviation. And of course, you can do this optimization for different number of clusters and, and so on. The point is that if you want to do this and you want to run the code hundreds of times, you can't afford to run it in all its glory with 3D and compositional and so forth. So you want to run it in a much simpler manner. And so you simplify the code to the point where it can be run in a reasonable time. Typically, these hundreds of simulations run in a few hours, you know, anything from six to 12 hours. So you run overnight. But if you try to make the problem too complicated, there's no way you can run these optimization codes. And the optimization of this completion for a particular pumping schedule increase your, increases your prop surface area by 1.9 times, which means if you're doubling your prop surface area, you're essentially achieving a doubling of your production capacity for the well. So you get a very significant benefit to trying to optimize your completion together with your pumping schedule. So, so this is something that this one example of a single well uh, fit for purpose simulation where you simplify the model to be able to get an answer that you are uh, looking for. You can also do uh, multi-well fracturing problems. So you can do fast evaluation of fractured well productivity, or you can do uh, choke management. Uh, how do you actually manage the choke? Do you open up the well uh, completely, or do you open it up slowly? How do you do choke management over time? Uh, we've done these simulations as well. Um, uh, sequencing. Uh, do you do zipper fracks or do you do um, uh, just sequential fracks? So I'll show you one example of how you do multi-well problems um, in with this simulation. So you have, uh, so you run these these simulations and you create fractures sequentially here, one after the other. Here you'll create a fracture in this well, you'll zipper it and you create a fracture in this well. 
you'll come back and create a fracture here, and then you'll create a fracture there, right? So these are two wells that are being zipper fractured, and you're trying to estimate what the uh, uniformity of these fractures will be, what is the kind of production that you'll get from these wells, and which design is actually going to be better. Are we over treating these wells, or can we reduce the, uh, the amount of treatment fluid, et cetera, right? And here's one result, one example result uh, of what this looks like. So if you look at sequential fracturing, uh, this is well one and well two, um, versus zipper fracturing, what you find is that in sequential fracturing, you get longer fractures. The average length of the fractures is 411 right, in sequential fracturing, whereas in zipper fracturing, the average fracture length is only 364 feet. However, the standard deviation which is how much variability there is between fractures is 200 feet here, 216 feet versus 158 feet. So if you're looking to get more uniform fractures, zippering these fractures is going to be a better technique. And this difference between sequential and zipper fracturing is a direct result of the stress shadow that these fractures impose on each other. And this results in um, a, a significant change in the geometry of these fractures resulting in these changes in the average and the standard deviation of the fractures, right? So um, it may be preferable to do zipper fracturing if you want to get more uniform fractures and get less interference between the wells. And of course, you can get the, the pressure in, in, in each stage in, in the sequential case, in the zipper case. You can get the half length of each of the fractures for the two cases and so forth, right? So you can get these detailed um, plots for each of the fractures and so on. You can also start exploring things like, what if I stagger the, the, the location of these fractures? So if I stagger it by 30 feet or 50 feet, in, by staggering I mean you, you shift the location of the perforations by 50 to 100 feet, depending on how far apart these wells are and, and, and so forth. You can actually look at, look at the staggering of these zipper fracts, and it makes a big difference. It really makes a difference. Once you've generated the fractures, you can actually understand you can actually produce these in the same in the same model, so you can actually deplete the the reservoir, and then you can have a, a a child well in the middle, and the child well will propagate fractures which may hit the parent wells, right? So the depletion of these wells, the propagation of fractures from a child well, all of this can be done within the same model, um, and the child well fractures tend to propagate preferentially towards the depleted zone. And this results in um, frac hits that might occur uh, in the child well stimulation. Okay. So one method that people have adopted in the last five, six years is to inject either refrac or inject fluids into the parent well, what is called preloading. So you preload this well by injecting either gas or water into the well or fracking the well. And the question was, in this particular slide, the question we are trying to address is what happens if you shut in the uh, parent well after preloading for seven days, 14 days, and 30 days? And what you find is that the time at which you get um, uh, these uh, frac hits is much longer, the pumping time is much longer if you only wait for a week. But if you wait for one month, you tend to get much shorter of a time at which the frac hits occur. And that's because the stress shadow from these wells or the increase in stress uh, from preloading these parent wells uh, goes away as a function of time. And that's something that can be captured by, by these models. So, so we've done quite a few studies on looking at how you can preload these wells, how long do you have to inject, what pressure and rate do you have to inject, and how long can you wait before this happens. Uh, the last example I want to give you is uh, an example from a water injection well. Uh, actually, the last but one example. So in this, what's happening is you have a sand shale sequence, and I'm just showing you a vertical well in which the fracture is, is growing as a result of water injection. And this fracture then grows into the shale and into the sand, and how far it grows into the sand and shale is very important from the point of view of the displacement efficiency and the oil recovery and, and so on. And one of the things that we looked at recently is what kind of containment do you get between the sand and the shale, including the poroelastic and thermal effects. 
uh, believe it or not, that's something that had never been done before um, in terms of looking at all of the photoelastic and thermal effects, including conduction effects. Uh, so uh, you can actually see thermoelastic effects due to cold water injection, uh, fracture opening. Um, so uh, the reason we got involved in this is because there were two different studies that asked us to two different fields that asked us to do this. One was a field in the Bering Sea um, where they were injecting cold water and they were concerned about the frack developing from the sand uh, into the shale and then breaching um, the surface of the of the ocean. So very crucial, very, very important. The entire project basically depended on what kind of height containment you could get with these. So we're still working on this. And uh, you, what you see, in fact, is uh, the stresses changing as a result of photoelastic effects, uh, production from neighboring wells, cold water resulting in uh, thermal stresses. So, and the stress in the bounding layer actually is affected by heat conduction. And in fact, if you neglect heat conduction, you find that this fracture may be contained. But if you don't ne uh, neglect heat conduction, uh, you find that the fracture will in fact grow into the shale. So some very interesting results that we're just beginning to, to publish uh, with uh, using these models. So accounting for thermoelastic and photoelastic effects is absolutely crucial. One last uh, example that we have uh, uh, that we have been working on over the last three, four years is huff and puff gas injection. We've been doing a bunch of experiments, as I said, and we are also converting those experiments into simulations uh, and looking at the effect of soak time on, uh, on the injection of uh, uh, first contact or multi-contact miscible fluids, things like CO2 or, or methane or lean gas and so on. So this is another example of how compositional simulations can be used here. The geomechanics can be simplified a little bit, but the compositional part obviously is essential uh, to do. So, so we've done those. So just a summary of what I've talked about. Um, Multifrac 3D is a fit for purpose toolbox that really fully couples multi-phase, multi-component reservoir flow with geomechanics as well as wellbore flow and fracture growth and enclosure. And it, it provides a useful toolbox. It has these capabilities in the reservoir simulation side. It's 3D, it's photoelastic, multi-phase, black oil, or compositional. On the geomechanics side, you can do 3D, pseudo 3D, or 2D. Linear elastic fracture mechanics, um, uh, thermoelasticity, and displacement discontinuity methods. If you have, if you want to speed up things with multiple fractures. Thermal options, convection, conduction, and thermoelasticity, uh, multiple competing fractures, prop and transport, fluid distribution in the wellbore and in the perforations, which is very important, much more important than I would have guessed um, a few years ago. Uh, reservoir options with arbitrary heterogeneity and natural fractures, um, of course, different rheology of fluids, and of course, serial and parallelized with dynamic mesh refinement and unrefinement. And we have actually built both a PC-based and a Unix-based version of this of this code. So uh, we have applied it to many different problems: uh, thermal fracturing, prop and placement, refracturing, parent-child wells, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, well bore stability, um, uh, casing failure, subsidence, and so on. So uh, the software, by the way, is available. Uh, so Multifrac 3D is available, and if you go to this website, austingeotech.com, or to the hydraulic fracturing, uh, hydraulic fracturing and sand control website, the, you can you can essentially download the software. Um, and for JIP members, it's a free download for 90 days, um, and you can do it online. Everything is can be done online. Uh, the instructions on how to activate each software license online is is available. Um, uh, if you if you need a, a licensing agreement, that's uh, available as well. Um, there's some uh, documentation for each software. Um, we're still working on some. Some are under preparation, but you can definitely go to the websites and download the software and start using it um, for two to three months without any issue. Um, so just to summarize my last uh, my last slide. It is important for us as modelers to offer users as complete a set of simulation uh, tools as possible with options for picking the tool that addresses their problem at a suitable level of complexity. So if you make the tool too complicated, 
Uh, it's very difficult to use. If you make it too simple, it misses a bunch of the physics. So I think uh, a fit for purpose simulator is essential if you're going to be able to uh, use it in a practical sense. Um, it is equally important for the user to choose the right level of complexity that captures all the first order effects and essential physics of the specific problem being solved. And as, as I said earlier, every problem is different, so it becomes very difficult to, to, um, to use one model for that, that fits all. So the user has to decide what complexity is required and what in, in what part of the problem is the complexity needed. Only when you do that, only when you do these two steps, is it possible to simulate a wide range of interesting field problems and make useful engineering predictions in a reasonable time frame using these simulation tools. Um, and when you compare these uh, simple or more complex simulation results with field observations, uh, you get some you get, you get excellent capital efficiency and um, the stuff that you do uh, has a direct impact on improving operational practices. So, so it's important that, that we do this if you're going to, um, if you're going to make these models uh, useful. And lastly, I want to thank all of the sponsors of uh, the JIP, our current sponsors, uh, um, and uh, we also have some past sponsors which are not on this list, um, but uh, I'd like to thank everybody for listening in and I will uh, stop here and take questions. Yeah, so I actually um, was going to say that uh, it's uh, uh, it's important to um, uh, to keep in mind that all of these all of this work that we do ultimately depends on um, the ability to model pieces of the problem in detail and then in integrate all of this into a larger model. And so um, the individual students that have been involved in doing this um, have worked on individual pieces of the, of the puzzle and then put it all into uh, a bigger piece. And the ability to actually do that and integrate these different pieces together is absolutely vital. Uh, without that, it becomes extremely difficult to actually um, uh, build models um, as complicated and sophisticated as this um, uh, without um, having individual efforts going on in parallel and then at the end of the day being able to integrate everything together um, into into a single model. So that's that's I think um, the way that software is built these days in the last decade and I think that's the approach that we have followed um, and I think our focus has been on incorporating all of this physics into uh, into uh, into our models and there's of course groups working on the mathematics and the numerics of this that are developing better and better tools on the numeric side. Now, that's not what we do, but but we have been great beneficiaries of uh, integration of these tools, uh, of these numerical tools into our into our code. Can we measure the near wellbore complexity through this model? So we, we have just published a paper with Shell, who has, uh, with, with their data actually, uh, that's going to be published in the hydraulic fracturing um, conference, um, uh, which has now been postponed, the 2021 hydraulic fracturing conference, in which we address that specific question in some detail. Um, and so uh, we have been, uh, I would say, partially successful in getting an idea of how to um, do that. In other words, we can get a very good idea of the fracture complexity um, uh, by doing what are called step down tests. And uh, Shell has actually run these step down tests uh, in, in several of their wells in several basins. And so the paper actually has data from about four different basins. And so the answer is a qualified yes, we can do that. Um, the next question was, can you give us an idea of the cost of the software for non-GIP members? So the software, uh, the Multifract 3D software, um, a single node or a single user license um, runs about uh, uh, 30 to 50,000 uh, per year based on the options that you choose. If you want the full thing, then it's 50. If you want to uh, scale down the, the options, then it could be uh, as little as 30,000. And the and the GIP members get about a 30 to 40 percent discount on that on that. Uh, let's say a third off that of that price. Uh, how do we maintain solution continuity between domains? Uh, example, capillary pressure. So 
all of the variables between the domains are have boundary conditions with the appropriate continuity relations built in. So for example, um, the fluxes um, are, are continuous. Uh, the, the, the capillary pressure is going to have some uh, degree of discontinuity uh, in, uh, in it, but primarily because physically there is a discontinuity as you go from the fracture into into the uh, into the matrix uh, because the matrix has a finite capillary pressure which we account which we have in the equations and and the fracture does not because it's obviously a much larger uh, pore space if you like uh, so so we do have appropriate boundary conditions that ensure continuity of the appropriate variables between the well bore and the fracture and between the fracture and the and the uh, and the matrix and be more than happy to show you that in much more detail if we have the time sometime. Does the SPE have standard set of problems to benchmark um, the fracturing software? So the SPE does have a set of standard software uh, standard uh, benchmark um, uh, problems. Um, most of them are pretty old, so they do not have uh, standard software problems that um, uh, are anywhere close to what we are doing here, which is multiple fractures propagating, um, geomechanics, and so on. So most of the reservoir simulation test cases are black oil or compositional cases without fracture propagation, without in, in most cases without geomechanics. So what we've done to try to address the uh, or validate the model is we've actually and I didn't show you the results today, but but I but I uh, if you're interested, we can certainly go over that is we've actually validated the model with all of the analytical equations available, certainly for black oil, some for compositional and all the geomechanics. So one so one D consolidation problem or the 2D uh, problems that have been that have analytical solutions available for geomechanics. So all those photoelastic and geomechanics problems have been validated using analytical solutions and these analytical solutions are you know we match those you know just perfectly so so we i feel pretty confident that what we're doing is indeed um, uh, accurate the the thermal part there are standard problems for that uh, analytical as well as numerical uh, so um, things like uh, the standard mark marks langenheim solution or or the Perkins and Kern solution and so on. So those are standard, very well known thermoelastic and thermal solutions that are available. And we've compared with all those analytical and uh, numerical uh, examples that are out there. Um, next question is a uh, great presentation. Thank you very much, Professor. This question is not really direct related to technical problems, but how do you think about the future of the area of hydraulic fracturing and the directions and trends of simulator development. Um, you know, I think that hydraulic fracturing is something that um, is going to be around for, for some time. Uh, I don't see that as going away uh, anytime soon. I know there's been a lot of talk about the issues in, involved in, um, in a seismicity and so forth. Uh, I believe that if we do things properly, and if we do things in a responsible way, that hydraulic fracturing is is um, is not the source of a lot of these issues. Uh, um, uh, there are instances where you can certainly misuse uh, the technology and overplay your hand, such as injecting very very large volumes of fluid in a tectonically active area or into the into the basement and so on. So I think if we are careful and if we are responsible, then I believe we can. Uh, we can continue to fracture for a long time. Uh, we've done millions, literally millions of hydraulic fracturing treatments around the world and uh, and certainly in the US. And I don't see that as um, there's a relatively few cases where we've had issues with seismicity. Uh, fortunately, nothing terribly, terribly serious. But I think in those areas, those issues need to be addressed properly and um, I think if you're careful and responsible, I think we can do this for a very long time. Uh, on the modeling side, I would say that um, these models are um, much more realistic than the models we had 10 years ago. Um, but I also feel that there's more to be done. Uh, 
A lot of these models that are based on surrogate models where we include uh, data from the field into the models through uh, either AI or through neural nets or through surrogate models. There's, um, um, that is actually um, uh, a trend that is growing that most a lot of people are taking their numerics, converting them into surrogate models and then using those surrogate models at least for part of the problem like we did for the uh, wellbore problem. Right? So, so that's a trend that's that's going on going on right now. But I think incorporating more physics, incorporating more complex natural fractures in a more computationally efficient manner. I think that's the direction that a lot of people are heading. Thank you for the talk. Uh, amazing achievement to integrate the complex physics into a system. Did any operator user report back discrepancies or agreement between the model prediction and field observations? That's a good question. So, so several operators have actually used the code. Um, I can tell you that we have been um, uh, working on uh, field problems for the last several years. And yes, we do see discrepancies or things that we can improve. So um, for example, um, uh, when we do completion designs, uh, perforation designs, perforation cluster designs, we were overcompensating, we were over predicting. In other words, we were doing uh, these tapered completions that were I think over tapered and we got some feedback from the field that these completions were over tapered. And so we are now putting in, uh, we are trying to see why this might be the case and we actually have uh, Minzang working on how we incorporate some of the newer physics into it, um, what happens in the well bore itself. So that's an example. Um, we do have many cases of where things have agreed with what's happened in the field. So for example, in parent child well interactions, uh, when you inject fluids for preloading the, the parent well, that really allows us to, uh, um, uh, to, this was tried out in the field by Devon, and actually it worked just fine. It worked just fine. We've done many cases of water injection uh, into, into, into conventional reservoirs, and those have been validated and verified. We've done about 40 different fields around the world. So we've done a lot of field work with these simulations over, over many, many years. Um, and so many times we are surprised by what we see in the field. Sometimes we do just fine. So, so there's many, many cases like that. I'm sorry, I'm, I missed out on most of the presentation. Is the simulator presented as good as the standard commercial simulators such as CMG, GEM, etc.? So I think the capabilities that this simulator has compared to CMG and GEM, etc., are very different. Uh, CMG and GEM are, they are compositional simulators that have the ability to simulate um, compositional plus geomechanics. Uh, they uh, have very limited capability in terms of simulating fracture propagation, uh, multiple fracture propagation, and treating the fractures as explicit entities rather than just high permeability grid blocks. And that's a big difference. So there's, there's a, a huge uh, difference between explicitly modeling the fractures as cracks in the continuum versus just putting them in as high permeability grid blocks in the simulator. So, so there's a big difference between what CMG and GEM does and, and what we do. And if you want to get the geomechanics right, and if you want to get the fracture propagation right, then you have to consider the fracture as an explicit entity. Otherwise, there's no way to effectively simulate prop and transport, uh, fracture closure, stresses created by the opening of the fracture, because when the fracture opens, it generates all this, this, this stress field. Uh, all of these things, have to account for an explicit crack uh, rather than a high permeability grid block. So there's a big difference between the two. And I think in some cases uh, that might be sufficient. What GEM does and CMG may, may be sufficient, but in many, many cases that's not sufficient. Um, can the simulator handle multi-stranded fractures with very tight spacings? So that's a good question. We've um, So we actually have a paper on that uh, on how uh, multi-stranded fractures are generated and this was presented at the hydraulic fracturing conference two years ago or was it last year I can't remember I think it was last last year maybe we presented that so I'll be happy to if you shoot me an email I'll be happy to shoot you uh, um, uh, the paper uh, but the, uh, the answer is yes we can do that in a limited way when the fractures get 
very close together, then of course the mesh size has to be extremely small. And that limits the computational time that you can run this for. So the closer the fracture swarms are and the closer the fractures are, the more difficulty you have numerically dealing with it. Right. And, and this is a this is a, a, a computational issue um, and not something that's inherently uh, missing in, in the physics of the code, but is computationally if you have a mesh size that's two meters or one meter and the fractures are half a meter apart, then obviously you're not going to be able to capture that. In fact, you may have trouble running it numerically. So, so as long as you can deal with the, the numerics and handle the numerics, then I think you're in, in pretty good shape. What considerations can be implemented to model fracture swarms? So I'll tell you very briefly what we did in that paper that we published uh, a year or two ago. When you have a fracture that's propagating and you have multiple fractures, so imagine that you have two or three fractures that are propagating together. Um, the stress shadow of one fracture on the other imposes a very non-uniform stress field on this propagating fracture. Most fracture propagation models which consider a single fracture propagating have a uniform stress field. And as a result, the fracture propagates in a uniform manner. Once you have a non-uniform stress field, then the fracture can split. The fracture phase can split and create swarms. So for example, if the fracture is has a higher stress on the top and a lower stress on the bottom, then you may actually have the fracture propagating in a different direction um, because of the reorientation of stresses. And this can result in fracture swarms being created when you have multiple fractures being that are propagating. Of course, the second mechanism, which is well known, is this heterogeneity. So heterogeneity can cause um, fracture swarms from forming. But even in a homogeneous rock, you can get fracture swarms uh, being created as a result of the stress heterogeneity that's created as a result of multiple fractures propagating together. And that is the mechanism that we talked about in our paper at the Hydraulic Fracturing Conference at the SPE. So, so it's a very interesting problem because we do see fracture swarms developing, particularly in the, in the work that we did in the Hydraulic Fracturing Test Site number one uh, in the Permian. Uh, there, was a, there was very clear evidence that uh, the number of fractures that were created were, were large, very large. And as a result, we were trying to understand how these this large number of fractures was being created. Was it natural fractures or was it the creation of these natural fracture swarms or, or hydraulic fracture swarms as a result of stress heterogeneity? And I think both mechanisms uh, are at work. Um, and when you do create these swarms, you can actually get these swarms occurring in a fairly short distance. In other words, the fracture the fractures can be literally a foot apart or a few inches apart as they as they grow. So so good question. <laughs> 